हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी गुवाहाटी एंड इन व्हाट वी वर डिस्कसिंग वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस एंड इन दिस पर्टिकुलर मॉड्यूल वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द बेसिक्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस फॉलोड बाय द वर्टिकल जेल इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस हॉरिजॉन्टल जेल इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस एंड देन इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर्स वी हैव ऑल्सो डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट वेरिएंट्स ऑफ द जेल इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस एंड देन अल्टीमेटली वी हैव ऑल्सो डिस्कस अबाउट द सम ऑफ द रिसर्च प्रॉब्लम्स वेयर यू कैन बी एबल टू यूटिलाइज द इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस एज अ टूल टू आंसर दोज क्वेश्चन एंड इन दिस इन दिस पर्टिकुलर सीरीज नाउ टूडे वी आर ऑल्सो गोइंग टू डिस्कस फ्यू मोर एक्सपेरिमेंट्स एंड फ्यू मोर रिसर्च प्रॉब्लम्स एंड Uh, while discussing the such this research problems you will be able to understand more and more uh, potential of the electrophoresis to solve the research problems related to your work once you have identified that the transcription factor is interacting the scientists are not going to satisfy there and they are actually more interested to know more and more question and that's why I, i as i said you know in this course we are not going to only discuss about the Uh, one problem what we are also going to tell you that the from from one problem you are going to see many more problems so what in the previous problem the scientists have identified that the transcription factor is interacting with dna and and based on that essay they can be able to identify the transcription factor now what they want is to know which region of the genome or which region of the dna the transcription factor is binding so this in this particular question what they want is that they have identified the transcription factor they know that it is binding to the gene of the gene x but what they want to know is they want to know the identify the region of the genome where this transcription factor is binding so now this question can be used or this question can be solved by the another essay so that that we are going to discuss anyway so that can be done in a food printing but before discussing for the food printing let me tell you how uh, the idea of food printing came so you can have the two wooden blocks so one wooden block you have one wooden block and now suppose you use a a cutter and cut this wooden block into the multiple pieces so what you are going to get you are going to get the multiple pieces and there will be no issues you will get you know you will cut this will be able to cut this wooden piece into multiple pieces because this there is no protection present onto this uh, uh, wooden block now uh, if you wrap this wooden block with a uh, uh, some uh, steel Uh, uh, steel pipe or something then what will happen is that you will be able to cut to this wooden block at the same location with the help of the cutter and you will can be able to cut at the lower side as well but you will not be able to cut at this point because this is already been protected from the steel so what you will see in the pattern is that there will be a intact dna present or intact wooden block present which is going to have the large chunk of the wooden block whereas in this case everything is going to be cut and cutting into the multiple pieces and that is the exactly way of so if i ask you where the footprint of the wooden block where is the footprint of the steel block which you have added you can easily say that this is the place where i have added the steel block because this is the wooden block which is not been cut by the cutter and that is what is the basic philosophy of doing the food printing in the same way you can actually cut the dna and that's how if you protect some region that region is not going to be cut by your cutters and that is actually is going to be the indication that it is the region where the protein is interacting so let's see with the dna so what will happen is that you, what you do is you take the genome and you use a dnas and our scheme to cut so if you take the genome and ask the enzyme to cut it into multiple pieces you are going to see the multiple pieces okay but if you protect some region of this dna or some region you can imagine that at this region uh, we have we have added a steel block so what will happen is the in this case because this is a uh, dna 
what we have done is we have added a protein block. So, in this case, this region is now going to be protected from the action of the enzyme. So, as a result, this portion is going to be remain uncut and this portion is not going to appear. So, the bands corresponding to this portion are actually the site where the protein of your where your protein is interacting and that is what the uh, philosophy of the footprinting of the DNA which means you can imagine that you have a very large DNA and in thus DNA at one point you have a region where the protein is bound. So, what will happen is if you cut this the, it is going to give you this pattern because it is not being protected, but if it is protected then you will get all other bands except the band which is corresponding to this region and that is why this region can be identified simply by sequencing these uh, bands and you will be able to know that re which region of the genome is being bound by this particular protein. How to perform this? So, to perform you need the different types of reagents, material and equipments. So, what are the reagents are required? You required a buffer A which actually contains the normal buffers and you know like 10 millimolar HEPAs, uh, NACL, sucrose, EDTA, Triton X100 and then you also require the uh, protease inhibitor PMSF. Then you require the buffer B which is exactly the same except that you need uh, glycerol, EDTA and PMSF. Then you require the buffer C which is the same uh, except that the it has a very high concentration of the NACL and then you require the DNA's binding buffer. So, that actually contains the DTT, glycerol, EDTA, MGCL2 and tris SCL PN7.6 and then you require the calcium and magnesium solutions which is like uh, 5 millimolar calcium, 10 millimolar magnesium chloride then you require the stop solutions which is like 200 millimolar NACL, 30 millimolar EDTA and 1 percent SDS and then you require the loading buffer. So, loading buffer is NaOH, pharmamide, 0.1 percent xylene cyanol and 1.1 percent bromophenol blue. Apart from that you require an enzyme which is called as DNAs and for performing this experiment you require a microfuge as well as the electrophoresis apparatus. Uh, so, in the step 1 you are going to prepare the nuclear extracts. For preparing the nuclear extract you have to suspend the 100 mg tissue in 0.5 ml of buffer A. Then you have to gently homogenize and then centrifuge at 5000 G for 2 minutes at 4 degree. And remember that all this procedure has to be done in a cold conditions like 4 degrees so that you will be able to protect the factors what is present in the nuclear extracts. Supernatant can be used as a cytoplasmic extract. Now, you are going once you centrifuge, you are going to get a pellet and the and the supernatant. The supernatant can be used as a cytoplasmic extract, whereas the pellet you will resuspend in buffer B and centrifuge at 5000 G for another 3 minutes. Then you dissolve the pellet. So, in after this also you are going to get a pellet and a supernatant. Then again you pellet you uh, dissolve it into 50 microliter of buffer C in ice for 30 minutes with a constant shaking. So, after this once you centrifuge at 10,000 rpm uh, you are going to get the, uh, the supernatant as well as you are going to get the pellet and that supernatant is known as the nuclear extract. You can actually estimate the, the amount of protein with the help of the lorry as well as the Bradford and that actually can be used even for the uh, you know for a, for a basis to see how much uh, activity you have. Uh, then you have to use the binding reaction buffers and so the binding reaction buffers for DNAs is DNAs binding buffer 25 microliter. Uh, then you require the labeled DNA 5 microliter KCL and then you have to add the uh, nuclear extracts and then you have the make up the volume to 50 microliter with the help of the distilled water. Because the control is very important, so you can also run a control where you cannot, you should not add the nuclear extracts. So, uh, 
so without a nuclear extract is going to tell you that you are going to get all the fragments in that particular reactions whereas when you add a nuclear extract and if the nuclear extract is having some protein which is binding to the dna that region is going to be protected from getting the cleaved now you mix the content of both the tubes gently in an ice bath for 10 minutes and add 50 microliter of calcium magnesium solution at 18 degree for 1 minute and then add 3 microliter of DNAs. Uh, incubate this mixture at 37 degrees Celsius for 1 minute. Then you add the stop solution so that you will be able to stop the activity of the DNA so that you will just going to do a limited DNS activity which means you are not going to allow the DNS to cut the DNA uh, for you know for a very very long time otherwise what will happen is the DNA is going to cut the DNA completely and you will not be able to see the fragments. The mixture is then subjected to the phenol chloroform extraction, ethanol precipitation and, and the resuspension in the 4 microliter of loading which means once this you are going to add the stop solutions then you have to recover those fragments simply by going through with the DNA precipitations and you know removal of the protein part. Then you run this mixture onto a 5% urea DNA sequencing gel for both in the uh, fragmented DNA samples. So you analyze the DNA pattern obtained for the footprints. So the results what you are going to see the results result you will see that this is the uh, this is the sample for the standard right so this is your control sample so what you see is you see the bands from top to bottom all the bands what you see is actually corresponding to the different amount different sizes of the nucleotides whereas in this in this four lane where you have actually added the nuclear extract what you see is that a large chunk of the region is not having any fragments and these are actually the footprint bands because that is what exactly happened. These are the bands which are disappeared from your treated sample means the sample where you have added the nuclear extracts. So the next problem is that the uh, scientists have isolated a old rock sample with DNA sample from the dinosaur's fossil they have isolated the DNA and did the PCR amplification with the random primers. Now they want to determine the size of the amplified DNA. So what they have done is they have isolated a old rock and that old rock was containing a small dinosaur fossil. So what they have done is they have isolated this particular fossil and then by the help of the uh, some uh, advanced technique they could be able to isolate the very small fragment of the DNA. But this amount of this DNA was not enough so that you can be able to do any kind of analysis like sequencing and you know the looking at the, the size of this DNA and what will be the uh, composition of the nucleotides in this particular DNA. So for this purpose they have to amplify. So what they have done, they have done a PCR and then they got the amplified DNA. So this amount of DNA was good enough. So now their question is how to determine the size of the DNA. So for this they can be able to use the agarose gel electrophoresis. So let us see how to do that. So in the, the size of a DNA can be determined by comparing the size of the known DNA molecules. The DNA of known sizes are resolved onto point percent agarose with the help along with the unknown samples. What you have to do is first resolve the DNA on the agarose gel uh, along with the DNA molecular weight markers. Then you calculate the relative RF values with the help of the migration of the DNA versus the migration of the DNA uh, dye. So migration of DNA versus the migration of the tracking dye and then you plot the log molecular weight versus relative RF value so that actually is going to give you a standard curve. Then you what you do is you perform a linear regression to calculate the, uh, the equations and that equation is going to be in the form of y equal to mx plus c. So that equation can be used to calculate the molecular weight of your unknown sample 
which means if suppose I have this is the uh, no so if I have the RF value of this I can just simply go either conventional way of going with the intercept and I can calculate the log molecular weight and then I can in easily go and calculate the molecular weight by taking the anti log or uh, I can just simply go with the uh, you know. So, what will be the result? Result in this essay is that you have first run the sample with the molecular weight marker and this is your sample. So, what you can do is simply calculate the RF value for these molecular weight markers and calculate the molecular weight of your unknown samples. So, if you have the softwares, you have the image analysis softwares, these image analysis software can easily be able to train with the help of the these uh, molecular weight markers. So, you know the, the size of these markers and then with the help of the softwares you can be able to do the calculation automatically without even plotting this because this plotting will always be done by the software itself and that actually is going to give you the size of the DNA. Let us move on to the next problem. So, the next problem is a PhD student have isolated messenger RNA from the cancer sample and he wants to use this messenger RNA for northern blotting. Now, he wants to check the quality of the messenger RNA. So, you know when you want to do the northern blotting or that actually anyway we are going to discuss in our subsequent lectures and uh, you the first thing is you have to understand the or you have to ident uh, uh, you know you have to know the quality of the messenger RNA which means how the messenger RNA is whether it is uh, intact or whether it is uh, degraded and all that because uh, if you use the degraded messenger RNA then your northern blotting is not results are not going to be uh, accurate and they will be not going to be conclusive. First is that the RNA gels are always been performed under the denaturating conditions and they are being performed in the denaturating condition because you have the secondary structures in RNA, you have the different types of secondary structures like stems, you have the hairpin loop, you have the pseudo loop, pseudo knot, you have the bulges, you have the internal loops and you have the multiple loops and how these secondary structures are not good because they allow the RNA to run fast onto the agarose gel. And if they will force, if they will run fast, it will give less time for the molecule to interact with the agarose gel and consequently there will be less resolution within the different RNA species. Destruction of secondary structure in the RNA structure minimizes these effect and allow the better separation on the agarose gel. So, because it has a secondary structure, it becomes very compact structure and because of that it actually runs very fast within the pores what is present in the agarose gels. And as you know uh, and I think we discussed in the past also that when you are doing a horizontal gel electrophoresis with the agarose as a matrix, the pore sizes within the agarose is very big compared to the pore sizes within the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. How to do that? The RNA sample and the agarose gel contains formaldehyde to denature the secondary structure present in the RNA and then that prevents the reformation of the double standard region in the RNA structures and that is actually going to let you to run this RNA into a uh, linear structures and that is how they will be able to get results nicely from the RNA, other RNA species and it will give you the better pattern. The materials and the equipments what you require to run the RNA gels what required is you need the agarose, you need the you require 10 x MOPS buffer, the composition of the MOPS buffer is given, uh, then you require the 37 percent formaldehyde solutions, then you require the RNA molecular weight mark ladder. So, this is different from the DNA ladder because here you are going to have the different sizes of the RNA. Uh, then you require the 0.5 molar ammonium acetate, then you require the staining dye which is the uh, 0.5 microgram per ml ethidium bromide and that is prepared in the 0.5 molar ammonium acetate. Then you require the RNAs free water, formamide, formaldehyde loading buffers and that is the composition of the formaldehyde loading buffer and the loading buffer can be filter sterilized. Uh, by the 0.2 micron filter and then it can be aliquoted into a small pieces and stored at minus 2 degree. 
what you require? You require the autoclave gloves, you require the water bath, you require the horizontal gel electrophoresis system, uh, you require the power supply, then you require a container where you can be able to store the RNS free uh, staining and destaining gels, then you require the shakers, you require the UV chambers, you require a gel duct and then you require a flask for preparing the agarose gel. It is a multi-step process, so in the step 1 itself you have to do the isolation of the messenger RNA, so that you are going to do with the help of the affinity purifications and that anyway we are going to discuss when we will discuss about the nudden blotting. Then you have to prepare the denaturating agarose gels and that is also a multiple steps. So in the step 1 you have to do the preparation of RNAs free water. So the RNAs free water is, is prepared by simply dissolving the diethyl pyrocarbonate or DUP, DEPC in deionized still water to a final concentration of 0.01 percent and DEPC is a strong inhibitor of RNAs. So that actually is an is inhibitor of RNAs which means it is actually going if you prepare or use the DEPC treated water it is actually going to protect your RNA from degradation because it is going to inactivate the RNAs what is present in the buffers or in the reaction mixtures. Uh, you stir this solution for 12 hours and then autoclave to disintegrate the DEPC and then you can store this solution at room temperature for very very long time. Then the third step you have to do a casting of the agarose gel. So in a flask add the 1 gram of agarose to the 75 ml of RNAs free water, heat the solutions to melt the agarose and observe the disappearance of the agarose flask. This I think we have already uh, discussed when we were discussing about the, the, uh, the agarose gel formation uh, when we were discussing about how to resolve this the, for the DNA as well. Then you allow the solution to cool down up to 55, 55 degrees Celsius. Inside a fuming hood add 10 ml of 10x MOS buffer and 18 ml of 37 percent formaldehyde. Set up the casting tray with a comb and pour the gel in a fuming hood. So at this stage you have to keep a very very care that the formaldehyde is very toxic and can be easily absorbed through skin wear gloves and you have to use the mask because formaldehyde is very uh, is, is evaporates very easily so that it actually get 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 into your body through the breathing so that is why you have to use the mask as well as you have to wear the gloves so that it should not get absorbed through skin as well. Now in the step 3 you have to prepare the R sample, RNA samples so take the RNA sample and make up to the make up to the 6.5 microliter with the appropriate quantity. So whatever the RN sample you have you just first prepare a 6.5 microliter of sample and to each sample you add the 2.5 microliter 10x mops running buffer 4.5 microliter of 37 percent formaldehyde and 11.5 microliter of formaldehyde formamide. So that actually is going to make a reaction mixture of 20 microliter, mix it by vertexing and briefly spin to collect the sample at the bottom. Then you inside the hood add 5 microliter of RNA loading buffer, mix it by vertexing and briefly spin it to collect the sample at the bottom. As you can see we are doing all this procedure under the fuming hood so that you should not get exposed to the fumes what is coming from the formaldehyde as well as the formamide. In the step 4 you do the loading of the RNA uh, samples, so fill the agarose denatured gel prepared with the 1 percent uh, 1x MOPS running buffer and load the RNA sample into the loan. So the loading is always exactly the same as what we have discussed of the loading of the DNA into the agarose gel uh, except that you have to be little careful that all these uh, tips and all other. Uh, instruments and uh, things what you are using should be sterilized because RNA is very sensitive for the degradation. So because the RNA is present everywhere so that is it actually get degraded very fast. So you have to sterilize everything and then you have to use the filter tips instead of the normal tips. 
Now in the step 5 you have to do the running of the uh, denaturating agarose. So place the lid onto the buffer chamber and perform the electrophoresis at 5 volt per centimeter until the die front reaches to the two third of the length. So this is exactly the same like you have to do the negative electrode, positive electrode and then you run the RNA and you have to run it up to the two third length of the gel. After this you have to do a staining and de-staining to visualize the RNA. Then you have to do the staining of the agarose uh, gel. So in a RNA free container, agarose gel is dipped into the 0.5 molar ammonium acetate for 40 minutes at room temperature. This is followed by, so you remove the solution and dip the block in a 0.5 molar ammonium acetate containing 0.5 microgram per ml ethidium bromide. So this is the staining dye which is prepared in the 0.5 molar ammonium sulphate. Then you incubate the gel in room temperature for 30 to 40 minutes and if required and the stain is too intense which means if you are not been able to see a better background or better contrast between the RNA as well as the uh, background then what you can do is you can simply do the de-stain by the 0.5 molar ammonium acetate for another 60 minutes to 2 hours. Then what you do is to transfer the gel to a UV chamber and capture the image with a gel documentation unit. A typical RNA profile is uh, look like like this. So here what you see is this is the RNA ladder. So what you see is the bands of the different sizes and the typical sample will look like like this where you have the RNA of different sizes and uh, this is going to be resolved. So these are the messenger RNAs of different sizes whereas normally when you run the DNA or the agarose gel which is not the denaturating gel what you see is that the full RNA is present at the bottom of the gel and not been resolved. So this what you see is actually a resolution of this which is where all the RNA bands are being separated into the multiple messenger RNAs and that is how you can be able to perform the northern blotting by transferring this into a membrane and with probing with the radioactive probes. So with this I would like to conclude our lecture here, thank you. Mm -hmm.